Hello, loved ones, and welcome back. It's good to see you. You're not gonna believe it. I missed you. And I know you're thinking, that is a weird thing to say, Chelsea. We haven't gone anywhere. If you haven't noticed, I haven't been on many lives. With the different holiday celebrations coming around and just spending time with the family around this particular time of year, I'm sure you understand. My mind hasn't necessarily been on just true crime like normally it is. But in today's case, my heart and my mind certainly lie with a story of a little girl. This is a highly requested case by one of my very valued Crime Light Channel family members out there. This particular individual was home as she was working through chemotherapy and it really touched my heart. So I wanted to honor this request and I wanted to thank you for recommending something that is so deeply powerful, something that we can absolutely talk about here on the channel. But my heart is so with this case, it's so sad. This is the case of six-year-old Elisa Esquiero. Elisa was a Puerto Rican Cuban American girl who died of a brain hemorrhage inflicted by her mother, Awilda Lopez, at the peak of a prolonged and increasing campaign of physical, mental, psychologically, emotional, and sexual child abuse. All of this was conducted between the year of 1994 and 1995. For those of you that are new here, welcome. I'm Chelsea J. This is my channel, Crime Light. And for those of you that are returning, you know that I missed you. Welcome back. I can be found mostly here with my favorite YouTube fam, you, and also on Spotify if you're looking for a podcast to cruise through your day. So beautiful, sweet little Elisa has been referred to as the modern day Cinderella. Elisa had a wonderful and very loving father for part of her childhood, which will evermore lead us to be very grateful and thankful that she was able to experience true love from a parent to a child. But carrying on, she also had faith-based kind of love and support from an additional outsider by the name of Prince Michael of Greece. Somebody that saw little Elisa's potential and had offered to support her to have a very successful life by paying her tuition until the 12th grade before the unfortunate mistake, error, judicial choice of being placed with her very crappy, hateful mother. Now, trigger warning, this is one of the worst child abuse cases that has ever existed, especially within the city of New York. We're going to talk about what the outcome was and is to stand for Elisa's story and her death and how it had to take her passing away for something to get done. And it shouldn't be that way, guys. So let's get into little Elisa's story who led a big life and had a future through her death that would change the nation. Elisa's biological father, Gustavo, was a Cuban immigrant who immigrated here to the States with aspiration to become a dance teacher. Whereas her mother, Iwilda, was a Puerto Rican woman who was raised in Brooklyn, New York. Now, two years prior to little Elisa's birth, Gustavo and Iwalda, they would end up meeting one another at the Fort Greene homeless shelter. Now, at the time, Gustavo worked as a part-time cleaner at the shelter as well as a part-time caterer. Unlike Gustavo, Iwilda was one of those individuals that she just had an addiction issue. Now, per my last video, I have come across a lot of really wonderful stories where a lot of you were able to give me your testimony and tell me what it was like being on the streets or maybe being a pastime addict. And I honor you so much for those of you that have never given up, that has had some kind of vision, light at the end of the tunnel, some reason why you found your why to be able to give up that life. And I know most of you have told me that this was a really difficult task. You've come forward and you've mentioned publicly in the comment section of the pastime video, the one that we talked about in Hollywood, just 
kind of how you did it. And I want you to know that you are so totally honored. And for those of you that are really fighting the good fight and trying, you too are very honored by my channel. Awilda, I believe in my heart, she had her sights set on healing this part of her life, her addiction, but she was one of those people that the fix had her by the root of her life. She couldn't seem to give it up. And that was always like what seemed like her first motive when she was in the shelter was she just, she really needed to get that fix. And so unlike Gustavo, Awilda wasn't holding those jobs or really strapping up her big girl boots and pulling it together. She was just kind of motivated to inch her way into being able to feed her addiction, unfortunately. Now, Awilda had two children. She had a son by the name of Rubensino, and she had a daughter by the name of Casey. And by January of 1989, it's unfortunate to report that she had lost custody already of both her first kids. Awilda was a temporary resident at the shelter as she had lost not only custody, but her previous apartment and had a pastime relationship by a gentleman named Ruben Rivera due to the couple's ability to make rent on time. And also it is said that it was partially because of her interest in continuously using, not quite being able to maintain a clean lifestyle. And so going back to Gustavo and Awilda, these two ended up starting a temporary relationship, but as soon as she was pregnant with Elisa, Gustavo would end up ending things because he started to realize that his partner or his temporary lover, now pregnant with his child, was addicted to the white stuff. And so this ends up going into the beginning of Elisa's entry into the world. Because her mother had this addiction, Elisa was born with the addiction to the substance that Awilda wasn't able to give up. At the time, social workers were immediately notifying the city's Child Welfare Administration Services as to Elisa's condition. As a result of Awilda's evident addiction, full custody was awarded to Elisa's father, Gustavo. Now, in a world where men step out on their own families, their own children, because these days, in my opinion, it happens. So in a world that we live in where men will not step up to the responsibility plate, Gustavo stepped in and he stepped up. He was Elisa's knight in shining armor on the white horse. This man was the idealistic father. He was the kind of guy that he didn't have parenting expertise or any kind of experience in the field of parenting, because why would he? This is his first child. And he started getting advice from family on how he can give Elisa the best life possible. He was organizing celebrations, big time celebrations for Elisa. He was taking classes to learn how to be the best parent and single dad that he could for his daughter. His daughter was Gustavo's why. I mean, she was his heartbeat. He loved her genuinely with every fiber of his being. One family member would remember Gustavo as the kind of guy that loved his daughter so much that it wasn't a question if he would give up anything and everything for her. He called her his little princess. In 1990, Gustavo enrolled his daughter into preschool, although shortly after, he had some health complications and struggled with his ability to pay for Elisa's schooling. Elisa was said to be an outstanding and promising student, and Gustavo was such a notable, dedicated father that both teachers and the school principal introduced her to one of the school's patrons, Prince Michael of Greece, in 1993. It's alleged that when Prince Michael actually made an appearance on the property of the school, little Elisa had so much love and so much energy as every kid does, right? And she was just like, boom! She just ran to this guy, jumped in his lap, and she loved on this man and stayed by his side for the rest of the day. And of course, who could turn that down? That's the kind of pure love that wonderful kids like Elisa had for others. And it touched Prince Michael's heart. And so in turn, he offered to pay for her tuition until she was in the 12th grade. And I mean, this is where a kid ought to just stop. They don't understand, but in turn, right? These people, 
Prince Michael and Elisa, they're like giving and giving. She gives a hug, he gives a little money. In turn, she gave a little note. She wrote him a little note, you guys. She wrote a note of gratitude to Prince Michael, allegedly on her own terms. And it didn't just stop at that. Prince Michael continued giving and she continued giving in turn from the note. He sent her a little gift and then back in return, she gave him another little note and then another gift. And so they just had this bond of giving and giving and gratefulness and gratitude and thankfulness. She's getting coached by this really awesome guy and she's got this like really good dad that loves her. And, and she's in a good school out there in New York. I mean, what a blessed life, especially to be that young and oh, how to love like Elisa did. Well, what seems like uh, good news is terrible news, but we're gonna have to see it as decent news for now. Awilda ended up getting signed to have her kids back because Awilda ended up beating her addiction. So in the meantime, Awilda ended up remarrying. She had a secure location for living. She had another child. She got custody back of her two kids. And I'm not saying that that's not nothing. That's actually a really, really big deal. Like if you are a recovering addict or you're working the pieces in your life to get your life back on track. I mean, if this part had a flaw in it or at some point had not been blessed to Ewilda to receive eventually her daughter Eliza back, then it goes to say that what we're about to learn probably wouldn't have happened at all. So it seems like Awilda is shaping up seemingly. In November of 1991, Awilda Lopez secured the right to obtain unsupervised rights to Eliza. And then eventually this got moved to awarding her custody of Eliza every second weekend. And later it would get said that the relatives, the siblings of Eliza would report that on the unsupervised weekend visits that Awilda ended up being awarded, that this was when the terrible abuse and neglect of Eliza had started. So, I mean, it was right under the nose of the judicial system. At the time, relatives were made aware verbally by the siblings, but nobody uh, took it upon themselves within the family to report it. Now, the parent that has the full custody as well as teachers within the school district, how could they not know that something like this was going on? Well, the answer is they did, so that's the good news, and they were moving on it. They started reporting that Elisa was acting a little bit different. And not only that, but she had symptoms, physical symptoms of looking and appearing differently when she would return than she did when she was sent to Awelda's. And again, this is within a year time frame. And so starting out through the process of that year, Elisa had some injuries on her genitalia and she started being a bit vocal, mentioning that she was being tossed in a closet and locked up like an animal. Now, I just wanna say that the biggest takeaway from this case is right here, this part, because sometimes as parents, we really do have to 100% to be really smart and utilize common sense, wisdom, and our conscience to really have an idea of what's going on with our kids. Read their energy, they are people. And I know Gustavo and the school district was doing that, but I wanna tell my audience today that as a pastime child from the foster system here in California, it is really important to listen to these kids and read their energy and check the marks on their body anytime that you send them anywhere and always helicopter parent. I don't care what kind of reputation that gives you as the supervisor of this child. Their life and well-being is in your hands. And so at this point, please, all signs and symptoms of Elisa that we learn here, please take very seriously and apply in every single point in your life that you can. Even with your friends' kids, it could be your best friend's kids. It could be kids in the school district. Listen to your child when they come home and they're talking about a kid that seems very troubled within the school district or someone's house. Just, just listen. These signs right here are a really big one. Let's get into it. Elisa started telling her dad that she didn't want to see her mom anymore. She vocalized her feelings on the matter of her visitations with Awilda. And if that wasn't enough for a child to express themselves, her body was speaking 
for her. She started bedwetting. She started losing control of her bowels. She started vomiting. She was having night terrors. She was having the sweats. She was not well. And she was telling her dad and she was vocalizing this and her little body had marks and bruises indicating that something was terribly wrong. And so the three signs right here are that she's saying it. And even if a kid doesn't say it, you got the fact that her body is showing it through reaction. And then if that's not even happening, she's getting banged up. So there's three humongous red flag signs going on right here. And so again, her father and the teachers were saying something, but really nothing was getting done because from the outside looking in, it probably just seemed like a case number or possibly like there's stability and a good marriage and other kids in the house. And so I'm not 100% sure why authorities didn't move in on this, why CPS didn't take better action on the matter. But they didn't, bottom line, even though there were multiple reports coming in. So Gustavo ended up requesting that Awilda's rights just be completely revoked. However, at the time, the judicial system ignored these big red flags. And you know what they did? They slapped Awilda on the hand and they just told her, keep your hands off your kid. Now, times were a little different back then. I do understand that a good spanking or some kind of disciplinary action with physical contact at the time back then might have been a little more acceptable than in today's age. I mean, I just read something about locally a teacher tossed a paper at a kid and it ended up paper cutting the kid and the teacher's getting like fired or sued, something big came out of it. And so, man, times have really changed. But to think about this being in the 1990s and having this be allowed or permitted. I don't know. I don't remember that being an okay thing back then. I mean, I was about four or five myself back around this time, but I just, I can't understand it. I can't because there, it was as bad as it gets besides the end of the story here. So like, what more did you need? This poor baby girl was already born to substances. She's getting tortured by her mom and she's vocalizing it and her body is reacting to it. Her dad is doing everything that he can. I mean, her world is just crumbling at this point. There's nothing she can do. She's helpless. She's a child. She's a dependent. She needs someone to come in and save the day. And like I mentioned in the video, Gustavo had so much love for his daughter that he said, you know what, screw this shit. I'm taking my kid and we're out of here. So he had decided that he was gonna remove baby Elisa and he was gonna take her to Cuba. Like what better way? than to take your child completely out of the situation, create distance and start anew. Gustavo, good man. So Gustavo ends up purchasing tickets in May of 1994 for himself and his baby girl, Elisa. Now talk about bad luck for Elisa and Gustavo. Gustavo in May ends up getting admitted into the hospital for a respiratory infection. And it turns out that it's lung cancer. Now, Gustavo was scheduled to fly out with his daughter on May 26th. The guy kicks the bucket. Gustavo passed away from cancer the day that he was set to fly out with his daughter and save her life. Now, what kind of hell are we looking at? Oh my God. She goes to Iwilda for answers and she wants to know what happened with her father. And Iwilda ends up screaming, not yelling, not just saying, not being a dick about it, but just screaming to be just a demon about it. Just a horrible person. She goes, your father's dead. It's no secret, things are just getting really bad. So the school's all over this. They're like calling up CPS, reporting, reporting, reporting. And I don't know what it was like back in 1994 when something like that happened. I know like personally for me as a foster kid back then, I went through a great deal of experiencing the streets and seeing a little too much when I was, you know, growing up with my biological mother before something was done about it. So I'm not 100% sure either in my personal history how many calls it took. I don't know if that was just the days where they didn't take something like this very seriously, but I don't know. They weren't taking it seriously for baby Elisa because the school's on it and CPS isn't like looking into this hard enough. And you would have thought 
with the recent court appearance that they would have absolutely taken it seriously. You would have thought that with the reports of her father and suddenly he dies, watch it closely. Be on that, man. You have one job. I get it. Multiple numbers of people that need your assistance, but you let one slip through the cracks and something like this is going to happen. A tragedy that we're about to get to right now. Upon learning of the news of her ex Gustavo's death, Awilda applied for full permanent custody of Elisa. She was initially granted temporary custody of the child. Now there was a cousin by the name of Elsa that was aware of Awilda getting temporary custody of baby Elisa. Now there were a lot of different people like Prince Michael was writing letters saying, I'll continue to pay for the education if you give custody to Elsa. The school board members were backing Elsa on being able to get full custody of Elisa just because everybody knew and you had to go through the judicial system to get to the end to which was best for Elisa. And obviously the system is supposed to be a place where we can count on things being placed fairly. And I know that it doesn't have a lot of good reputation for that. And it's like stories like this, why? Elsa would attend different court hearings on behalf of Elisa, but she didn't have the money to be able to represent through a, an attorney. Now it's said through the Legal Aid Society and federally funded parenting program that Elsa was up against Awilda, but Awilda's the one that had the attorney. And so unfortunately, having representation over no representation in the country we live in, man, that's what ended up happening was Elsa was overruled and the attorneys went to bat for Ewilda and they ended up winning, unfortunately. It was said by Judge Greenbaum. Now, Judge Greenbaum, if you want to remember that name, was the one that approved this in 1994. Ewilda Lopez, unfortunately and successfully won custody over Elsa for Elisa. Now, of course, this witch of a mother, hate to say, I try not to throw judgment around, but come all the way on. The choices that she ended up making, oh, let's just get into it. Awilda ended up taking her baby girl out of the private school where the tuition was supposed to be paid for. People loved on her. I mean, they had concerns because they loved this little girl, but she was removed, of course, kind of like a narcissistic move from Awilda. Like, honestly, why else would you remove your child from what's in their best interest. I mean, she's already had it rough growing up. She's lost her father, who was her hero. She was almost adopted to a cousin. I mean, Aliza is really going through it. And so Awilda ended up putting her in a public school system instead of the private school where people could really keep an eye on her and love on her. And in the public school, Eliza was not doing good at all. She was socially distant. She was withdrawn. She wasn't talking anymore. She was urinating herself frequently and the bruises on Elisa's body continued to grow and become more noticeable. Now, if you let it sink in what's going on with this little girl, her body and her spirit, her energy, who she is, her very soul is it's done. It's it's giving up because she's tried to tell people. She's tried to love on people. She did everything right and she's still having to go through hell on earth. And why would she start talking? Why would she try to make friends? Like why? I mean, and who knows behind closed doors how bad things were getting. I mean, maybe for every right that Eliza was doing wrong, Awilda might have just been shaming her tenfold on just the little inch of right that Eliza would give. If you think about it, for example, she would try to say how she was feeling and then her mom would shame her and then all of her vocal requests were ignored and then her father died. So at this point, she's just not talking anymore. And also for trauma purposes. I mean, we can't deny that she was completely traumatized and she's so young at this point in time. So she comes up with a new traumatic habit and guys, this is just... It's hard for me to talk about. Like my chest tightens. This isn't something that comes easy to me to just sit here and tell a story. This is something that I feel so badly for just investing into it. It's very emotional. So at this point in time, baby Lisa is starting to tear out parts of her hair. I mean, it's just the, the worse things are getting, the worse she's behaving, the worse the trauma is. It's like the more she's kind of showing signs of giving up or self-harm. 
I don't know, maybe she felt like at that point in time, like she wasn't worthy of love. And so she started harming herself. I can only imagine honestly what it takes to drive somebody that's so young that has been put through so much in her little young life, what it's gonna take to drive her to that. On March 14th of 1995, an anonymous letter was posted to the Manhattan Child Welfare Authorities. The author of this letter stated that Awilda Lopez had cut off much of Elisa's hair and had began locking her in a dark room for extensive periods of time. Six days later, Elisa was admitted to the hospital with a fractured shoulder, having been untreated for three days. Now, I can tell you without a shadow of a doubt that there is always a loophole somewhere if someone really wants to do something. So, for example, in my years of managing or, you know, like doing different things in life, if, if I really wanted to see something through, there was always kind of an ace in the back of my pocket, you know? Like I could really have really, really good over the top complimentary gifts or services to people if that's something that I really wanted. And I've seen it in different cases that we've covered where homicide detectives or maybe a particular police officer, they just get this kind of hair where they feel like something's wrong and then they go after it even though it's above and beyond their job description or maybe they're really just not supposed to be doing that. They know within themselves because they're looking into it and they're taking it seriously. Look at the video that I did Dexter about the homicide detective that ended up going after the missing guy in that video because it wasn't in his job description too, but he knew something was wrong and he wanted to help. And so in this case, the school system, the public school system that, I mean, this is school number two, they started reporting in as well that they had their concerns with baby Eliza. Well, CPS ended up saying that there wasn't enough evidence to really convict a Wilda or remove Eliza from the home. So just right there. Like, I get you, New York. I understand that you're a really, really busy city, and I can't imagine the workload that is stacked on your desk and all the hundreds of people that need you, but that is your job, and it is your responsibility, and for those of you that were working on this case, you did it job. Nobody cared enough when it was brought to the attention by multiple schools, multiple different people, anonymous letters. I mean, come the hell on man. So at some point during all this crazy tornado action, a Wilda ends up getting back into substance abuse. I mean, it's obvious that whatever a Wilda was doing, uh, her brain was probably changing because she's back into the game again where she's using. I mean, there could have been a mental illness and I don't really know because like I wasn't there and there's not like a whole lot of information out on it, but I do believe end of the day that Awilda hated her daughter. I don't think she had one drop of love for this baby girl at all. I think the whole time that she was able to get custody back of her other two kids and she remarried, I think all of it was for herself. The house was stability, the kids were a good look, the marriage was to make her feel good about herself, maybe loved, I'm not sure, but when it came to actually being responsible and loving her own daughter, there was just nothing there. And so it doesn't surprise me that we learned that when Awilda started getting looked into again for the issues and the complaints that were happening with Eliza, she just withdrew her daughter from school entirely and she didn't put her back in school at all. And at this time, there's just a lot more going on. There's no more signs for the public to see besides the fact that baby Eliza has just like vanished. But at home behind closed doors, things were tough. And like I was saying, it seems to me that Awilda just had zero love in her heart. And in fact, very opposite. It wasn't even just white or gray. She was just in the black of things. And Awilda just completely mistreated the heck out of her daughter, Eliza. Now neighbors would end up saying her mother was not this way with any of the other children. Her mother specifically targeted Eliza. Neighbors would tell later on that they would hear baby Eliza crying, that they would hear her say, mommy, I'm sorry, stop, no more, please, I'm sorry. 
and that Elisa was reportedly not allowed to use a toilet but allowed a chamber pot. And then the siblings would try to intervene or ignore it, but they knew that they were pretty helpless in the situation. And there's just things that I'm not actually going to put on here to continue keeping it censored. I don't want to destroy you with this story. I want you to become aware. And so there were just particular names that Elisa was called by Awilda. What Awilda was doing is just horrendous. And so everybody knew and Elisa was not being monitored by CPS and nobody was checking in on her. There was nothing anyone could do. Her mother was just driving the point home by telling Elisa she was a child that had been placed under a spell by Gustavo, Elisa's father, which talk about psychological abuse. To use your hero's name like that to utilize your deceased parent someone that really loved you to say you know what you were uh you were brainwashed by this guy you were under a spell a representative from the federally funded parenting program which had endorsed Awilda's initial motion to achieve sole custody of her daughter also reported at this time that Awilda had herself phoned him complaining that her daughter was unable to control her bladder or bowels. She had cut off her own hair and was apparently drinking from the toilet. And in response to this, the individual ended up reporting to CPS. And so just be advised that there's just consistent signs going on where people are like making these phone calls and nothing's getting done about it. And also that's gross and twisted that Awilda would end up calling somebody that, you know, petitioned for her to get custody and turn herself in but blame her child. It's like a psychological mind game of some sort. So other things had started to happen terribly bad things. Awilda had started violating her daughter with a hairbrush sexually in every single way that you can think of. Vaginally, through the back door. It was said that Elisa was forced to eat her own feces and that her head and her, her hair had been utilized to mop the floor, to clean the floor, and that she would be placed to be hung from a shower rod for entertainment purposes for her mother and her siblings to be a laughing stock. Now, the partner, Carlos Lopez, he was also in on some of this and he was also known to be Amazing. two other kids in the home. So the partner wasn't just paying the bills on standby or, you know, going to work like, you know, Ruby Frank's husband, like, oh, I didn't know this was going on. He knew what was going on. In his own sick ways, he was a little bit a part of some of this with Elisa. Now, later that year in November, Awilda ended up calling her sister. Mercy Torres was the sister's name. And she ended up kind of turning herself in to the sister and yet at the same time playing victim. She ends up telling Mercy that Elisa is laying on the bed and she's acting special needs. She's not eating, she's not drinking, she's having zero control over her bowel movements and that she's got fluids coming out of her nose and her mouth which this was bad. This was brain fluid. Now of course Mercy's like well take her to the hospital. And Awilda goes, I'll think about it. The next morning, Awilda ended up grabbing a neighbor and she brings a neighbor in to see her daughter who baby Elisa had passed away at some point in the middle of the night. She was deceased and laying there on the bed. So the neighbor says, oh my God, call authorities right now. She starts panicking and Awilda goes, I'm not gonna do it. And so the neighbor goes, well, then I'm gonna do it. And Awilda goes, no. If you do it, I'm gonna kill myself. While in custody, Awilda initially confessed to having thrown sweet baby girl Elisa headfirst into a concrete wall two days prior to her contacting her neighbor, adding that Elisa had neither talked nor walked after this incident. An autopsy revealed numerous injuries, including broken fingers, one bone of which was protruding through the skin, a broken toe, damage to internal organs, and deep welts and burns across her head, face, and body. In addition, her genitalia and rectum had bore evidence of trauma, including tearing. 30 circular marks upon her body were found to be impressions left by the stone ring of the individual who struck Elisa. Forensically, it was proven that the injuries had been sustained over prolonged periods of time. They had a funeral for this baby, Elisa. 
on November 29th of 1995. At the funeral, it was actually announced that Elisa had been murdered by her mother, but also there was a lot of blame to be had by those who were silenced and did nothing in knowing that Elisa had been suffering. And so in a lot of ways, there were people that had blood on their hands from not doing anything about this because it was definitely a preventable occurrence. Prior to Elisa's burial, a wake was held. Those present at Elisa's wake and funeral included relatives, neighbors, politicians, Prince Michael of Greece, who had been supporting her financially through school, and the members of the public touched by the case. Elisa was buried with a lot of flowers, different toys of honor, and she was also laid to rest with a Barbie that Gustavo had given his daughter, to which she had cherished while she was still alive in memory of her father. Awilda Lopez pleaded guilty to second degree murder of her daughter. Upon the advice of her attorney, Daniel Olin, Awilda pleaded guilty to this deal offered by the prosecution team with the knowledge that she would become eligible for parole after serving 15 years imprisonment. The following month, the same judge sentenced Awilda Lopez to term of 15 years to life imprisonment. Prior to formal sentencing, the judge openly criticized the child welfare system within New York stating, we have not created procedures to do everything necessary to protect the young and vulnerable in this society. The system has failed to protect our babies and don't tell me how much it costs. If anything good comes from this horrendous tragedy, it will be that we give priority to these babies. Awilda Lopez initially became eligible for parole in 2010. She was denied parole in January 2022, but released from the correctional facility on April 19th of 2022. Elisa's stepfather, Carlos Lopez, in October of 1996, was was sentenced to serve between one and a half to three years in prison to run consecutive with the sentence he was serving at the time of Elisa's death. The sentence was in relation to one specific incident of physical abuse dating from October 31st, 1995, to which he had repeatedly banged Elisa's head against concrete wall with the presence of her siblings in the room. At first, Carlos pleaded not guilty to his charge and attempted second degree assault, claiming he had not actually assaulted assaulted Elisa, but opted to do so in sparing his children the emotional trauma of having to testify against him. The judge rejected his claim outright, adding that the prosecution team had largely chosen to charge Carlos Lopez with this charge to spare Elisa's siblings to any further psychological or emotional trauma. Now, everybody is freaking pissed off by this point. I mean, the public are going amok. They're upset. How could this go wrong? How could you miss this? How could you let this happen? And at the same time, we end up seeing the frame of mind, okay? right? I talk about it constantly. What are you thinking? What kind of person are you at the heart? Not just the mood swing that you're in or the time in your life, but like, who are you out for? Who are you as a person? The way that Awilda and Carlos acted after their sentencing was absolutely no remorse for the fact that someone had died. And it was also the way that they died and who had died. Elisa was their child, the sibling of the other children in the home. She was somebody. And so her mother's like trying to petition for parole early. And Carlos was sitting there using his kids saying, you know what, I really don't want them to have to testify against me. So yeah, okay. You know, and the judge is like, actually, you're a danger to society, sir. And this is why I'm rejecting your claims. So the public's really upset. And there were stories posted in the New York Times. This story went national. On February 12th, 1996, Governor George Pataki formally signed Elisa's law into legislation. This legislation named in Elisa's honor was signed into law in the presence of several relatives of Elisa, plus numerous social workers and school teachers who had all attempted to intervene and or inform child welfare authorities of their collective efforts to present the child being with or remaining in the sole custody of her mother. Elisa's law is designed to balance the need for increased accountability through the public awareness and government 
government oversight with the privacy interests of individuals involved in child protective services cases, particularly with regards of death of children previously reported to child welfare services as suffering any form of neglect or abuse. All reports pertaining to the deaths of children resulting from child abuse available for public scrutiny do not name the actual deceased child or children or the actual caseworkers assigned to investigate reports of suspected child abuse or neglect relating to the deceased child. However, these reports do list each every complaint and or report submitted relating to the child or children and the agency's actual response. In addition, these public records contain an assessment detailing whether or not the agency's overall response has been adequate. Aliza's law continues to hold Child Welfare Agency of New York City and Administration for Children's Services publicly accountable for its performance. So I think that's amazing because that goes to show that you're not just showing up with your Starbucks in your office and choosing when, how, where, with who, and why you're going to take on these cases, but actually having the need to drive yourself to do the actual job above and beyond because there are lives at stake. And so what now? This has been a tough time, especially for those of us here in New York who um, were deeply saddened that as I'm speaking now, just last week, five children were allegedly killed at the hands of their parents. Recently, the decomposed body of a 20-month-old baby boy found in a dumpster behind his family's apartment. His parents charged with the death. Also in New York, a seven-month-old baby girl allegedly tossed to her death from a fourth-floor window by her own mother. The list goes on and on. There's perhaps nothing sadder for any of us than the death of a child. And when the child's mother is the prime suspect, it only compounds such a tragedy. Here is more of our exclusive jailhouse interview with Awilda Lopez, a 29-year-old mother accused of second-degree murder in the death of her little girl. Did you abuse her? Hitting her? Mm -hmm. I used to hit her, you know. For that, I say I got to pay because I used to spank her and everything. That I know I got to pay, but I didn't murder my own daughter. Did, I didn't do did that. Did you abuse her to the point of burns? Did you abuse no, her? No, I never burn her. Never. How about bruises? No, if I would have hit her, I would have hit her with my hand. I would have spanked on her the butt and everything. But yeah. I never bruised her, like bruised her body like that. No, I didn't do did that to her. There's also a word that you did things like mop the floor with her hair. Did you mop the floor with her hair? I never mopped the floor with my daughter's hair. Never. Did you lock her up in her room ever? Right, like, one day, but not like locking her in there forever. Their word is that you made her eat her own feces. I never made her eat her own stuff. Never. These are some of the worst accusations against They're a person. They're putting me like if I'm a monster, and I'm not a monster. Aliza's siblings ended up going into foster care shortly after that. And it's said to this day that they suffer with an immense amount of trauma just by being a witness to what happened to Eliza. I mean, they were sitting there watching her die every day. I mean, imagine having to live with that for the rest of your life. I can't believe this, to be honest. This story blew my mind. And finally, regarding the judge, Judge Greenbaum, who kind of let this all slide and ended up awarding custody to Awilda. I, again, I don't know what I would do if I was in that situation. Well, first of all, I wouldn't be. And second of all, in answering for myself, I just don't, I don't think it, it would be in my heart to overlook something like this. But when Judge Greenbaum was questioned and criticized, Judge Greenbaum basically threw the book at everybody and said, well, I was merely doing what I was supposed to and kind of was able to back and prove protocol within the judicial system, which I don't know, man, I don't think there's any winners in that case because you're in denial of the blood that's on your hands, in my opinion. And I'm not someone to judge, but there's gonna be somebody you're gonna have to face after your time here. And I don't know, what does that say about New York's judicial system? I mean, I have questions. I mean, did they take you back? Because you're making them look really shitty. So 
nobody won in this situation. It was very sad, very tragic, and I just, I again, I thank you to my audience, the member out there that told me to look into this case. I really appreciate it. It was a hard one. It was tough on my emotions. I mean, there were multiple times in the video that I was like on the edge of my seat, like teary-eyed. That was a tough one. I didn't like studying the details, but it's not right to turn an eye to these details because I feel like that's how these things get missed. And so what are your thoughts? Did you know about Elisa's story? And what are you thinking about Carlos and Awilda? What about Gustavo? and just the horrible luck that he and Elisa faced together. It really felt like the more good that they did together, the worse off their luck was. It really felt like um, something evil was working against something good here. And there was just an army of lazy people who could have been heroes and could have been angels and could have been saving a life. And not only that, but all of the trauma that the five other siblings had to endure. And think about the foster parents and the school systems and the friends and the potential future partners to these poor siblings. I mean, what the hell are these poor kids gonna do? I mean, how do you pick yourself up and say, you know what, I saw this. This was a national story. This was my sibling and I couldn't do anything about it because nobody listened to me and just struggling. I don't know, what are your thoughts, guys? Thank you for tuning in. Don't forget the signs. Always look for the signs. Kids do speak. Their bodies speak to us. They are people, they are souls and they're dependents and they need us and they might need you. Someone might need you right now. Thank you again for tuning in. I'm Chelsea J. I appreciate your time. And I hope you have a blessed week. And I will be seeing you next week for another video. Prime Light out.